This is 52 Managers and my name is Alex. In this video I'll be sharing my journey of building a scenic 6x4 foot wargaming table. But I want to get into some specifics. How much does it cost and how long does it take to build a wargaming table? Let's get stuck right in. In the last video, linked above, I built a wooden frame for this wargaming board as well as work out the general layout and thematics. I carved out my landscape out of XPS foam, adding detailed plastic elements. In my case, 3D printed trenches and bunkers. After all that massive world building, I felt like getting into some details. If there was a god that built the universe in a week, chilling on the seventh day, I'm assuming there must have been an absolute army of minor engineering angels tweaking the little details. Like designing a special species of deep water shrimp, or all the folk working in the famous department for development of individual snow crystals. And I now felt like one of those little angels. No heresy intended. I had bridges to build, crossing my little river and trench sections. I decided to base these out of real wood, namely ice cream sticks. These can be bought in bulk in craft stores or online. Or you can just save up through all the years of bribing your child or yourself with frozen sugar. I opted for the less sticky kind. These wooden sticks, most often beech, are strong yet easy to carve, easy to split into thinner strips and you can scratch up a nice exaggerated wood grain texture with the help of a steel wire brush. And most importantly, excessively cheap. Every single piece of wood used in this video is carved to look like it's a bit crooked then scratched and chipped with a hobby knife. For the bridge over the river, I used two filament 3D printed cast iron looking bridge supports. For the other two bridges, I used an eye shaped wooden beam I found lying around. No idea where this came from, honestly. All the popsicle sticks were glued on using white glue or carpenter's glue. It dries slowly, but just creates such a strong bond that I'll never have to worry about any of this ever coming off. Oh, and it's cheap, too. Building a 6x4 foot gaming table is an equation based on time, money and complexity. Or detail level, if you will. We could argue that complexity equals time, and because time equals money, complexity must equal money. And because time is apparently money, then all we're left with by the end of the equation is money. And this can be proven by the fact that you can just pay someone else to build a board, losing nothing but money. Unfortunately, there are hidden factors such as hobby equals fun or simply I'm broke to take into account. For example, building a small jetty out of ice cream sticks, longer strips of wood glued into L shapes, then filled with small strips of hand carved planks, eventually fastened in place with barbecue skewers as poles in the ground is awesome fun and practically for free. It takes quite some time, but my hobby level funometer is maxing out. Because my complexity level is set on high, I need details like this on my board. But this complexity level could be disregarded and your table would get done a lot faster. I mean, a jetty like this, that actually makes no sense and will not affect gameplay the slightest. It's just a visual enhancer. What I'm trying to say with my mumbo jumbo equations, you'd recognize them if you ever talk to a bank about taking a loan, is that there is no way I can say how long your board will take to build. If you're content with a flat board with some green flock on it and some rudimentary foam hills, you can probably churn one out in a weekend. I guess instead, my demonstration will be experimenting with different techniques and materials. Thus, you can decide whether any of these steps are for you, increasing the time span for your project for every chosen step or detail. I kind of do want to wag a warning finger. My table has gotten completely out of hand, and if I couldn't be building on this during more hours than regular hobby hours, thanks to my dear patrons and video sponsors, then this table build would probably be a year in the making. I mean, I seriously thought I would have worked my way through a lot more than I have. But all the real estate eats hours. Six by four foot is big. 
making sure we have a fun and varied process and not promising anyone when it's going to be done is probably important. My major building blocks here are XPS foam. The six 50mm thick sheets cost about $70, a great material in my opinion, and I would like to show you one major reason, apart from the fact that it's lightweight, easy to carve and shape with a knife. XPS foam does not have much memory. I don't mean you shouldn't be surprised if it doesn't remember where it was born or what its name is. It's a term used for materials. A material with a good memory remembers its original shape and when something is pressed into it, it tries to expand back into that original shape. XPS does not do this much, and so you can press things into the foam and it stays that shape. The foam also is, I guess you could call, fine-grained. So even small details pressed into the surface stay pressed in. I noticed, for example, when sitting on the board during the last video, that the fabric texture of my jeans had been stamped into the surface. Obviously under the awesome pressure of my behind, but still. So what I did was steal two stones from my son's stone collection. One with a nice sort of flat, in-scale rocky texture, and one with some sharper edges, and started pressing them into my hill section. Like a stamp. Although not excessively visible now without paint on it, this creates a pretty decent rock texture. The XPS is rather soft, so with the stones I can not only create texture, but also shape and push sculpt the entire hill into something that is rounder and more rock-like than the sharp smooth edges left from my knife or wire cutter. Again, I'm amazed of how big the hill is and how small my stone is. We're once more trading complexity with time, but at least the stones were free. And we're using the base construction material as the only material needed before painting. For the rest of the board, I textured using a ball of aluminium foil. Pressed in, this leaves a ground-like texture, nothing extreme, but a bit more exciting than flat carved XPS. I should probably shortly explain my intended process. I do intend to add varied textures along the way. Texture paste, sand, stones, rubble, tile grout, maybe even flock. But I want to do so with purpose, to create different textures on different sections on the board. I don't want all the ground to be the same, or all of the hill to be the same. Because of this, I want to make sure that I don't have to cover the foam just because it needs covering up to make it look apart. By texturing all the foam to a decent level means I can, metaphorically speaking, paint on textures where I want and won't be forced to put them where I don't want. And for those of you that don't want to bother too much about the myriad of textures I'll be adding in the future, texturing XPS like this and just painting it up is a great shortcut, especially for hills and such. Here's another way to use the properties of the XPS. Melting it. Beware, the fumes are toxic. And don't actually put it on fire. But carefully melting the surface with a uh, creme brulee torch creates this sort of sand dune effect. Melting it a little more creates a sort of webbing, almost. I thought this would suit a sort of swamp-like section of the board around the little jetty. Some greenish brown paints, tufts and some puddles of water effect and I think this is going to look pretty good. When building something as large as this but still going for a sort of diorama level of detail there is one trick I think is important as to only get responsibly overwhelmed and not actually hit the wall overwhelmed. That's to incorporate high detail level bits using them like trophies on the board, visual beacons that will draw the eye, like the 3D printed bits I've already placed. Behind this shroud of detail, one can hide less detailed areas, giving an overall impressive appearance without having to super detail the entire six by four foot table. To help me along in that regard, I'm going to use some rock molds and cast plaster rocks. By the way, I added some black pigment powder to the plaster mix to get grey rocks. Plaster like this is relatively easy to chip while things are in storage or if you play with specifically savage opponents on the table. Beware of folk who field orcs. Anyway, chipping off the grey paint from a white plaster cast rock will look terrible. 
chipping off grey paint from a grey plaster cast will hardly be visible. These moulds are not super cheap, but they are, of course, reusable. For one project like this, it's maybe a bit overkill, but over a period of a few years, a few diorama builds, a few scattered terrain pieces and so on, and they're worth considering. If you really want to make sure you get use out of them, cast up a bunch of rocks and store them in a box. That way you can always grab a rock whenever you need one and not have to go through the whole casting process whenever you feel the need for a miniature rock in your life. Another philosophy that needs to be presented regarding this table build, born out of my attempt to create something relatively realistic looking, is the use of a variety of different materials. So most of the table is carved from XPS. I can only shape XPS fast in a certain way, limited to how the blade cuts the foam. The sheet nature of the structure also adds a certain look. Every segment added is unintentionally of similar height, based on the thickness of the foam sheet. Adding rock molds like this or other future elements changes things. I can glue on an overhang where my wire cutter has cut a smooth slope, or a rock sticking out of a flat carved surface. Not only adding detail, but a more varied and realistic shapes to the landscape. And on that subject, we can have a look at some cork bark. You can find this stuff in pet shops. I think they're used to stick your lizard in, or dip, in the fish tank. And in a miniature scale world, the bark texture looks just like rocks. For example, this diorama I built a while back is entirely based on cork bark. Link to the full video above. All the cork I bought to use on this board cost about $20. Keep an eye out for flat strips if you want to fill a cliff like I did, or the regular branch-shaped tubes for rocks and more random bits. I'd previously built the majority of the cliff face, but it needed some attention to detail. I also used chunks of bark as larger rocks on the entire board. But when building a cliff face like this, there's usually gaps and holes that are difficult to fill completely, and so I used aluminium foil. First brushing on a lot of white glue, then forcing in the aluminium foil. It kind of shapes itself like a rock texture naturally when forcing it into a confined space like this. And then covered everything again with a layer of white glue. This again is another detail level commitment, adding another hour or so to my long list of hours. A result that in the end will not be of major difference when you see this from several feet away, but that soothes my inner perfectionist. But I wanted to show you this because aluminium foil can make some decent rock-like structures in itself, and that path can be worth exploring when you're on a budget. Make sure you try and cover it with a lot of glue or Mod Podge or something because it does not take paint very well otherwise. Now we're about to embark on the most lengthy of enterprise, and frankly for you the most boring. This is a step that a more entertaining-minded content creator would have surmised in a sentence and quickly moved on to something with a bit more razzle-dazzle. Maybe I should have put the smoke machine on while filming, or dressed up more alluring. But there is a moral to this story that, well, it won't make you more wary of wolves dressed up as grannies, but it most definitely is on the topic with the theme of the video. Time and money. I mixed my own texture paste. This can be a thing. A 100ml tub of hobby brand texture paste costs in the range of about $10. I found this 250ml tub of acrylic modeling paste in a cheap craft store for $6. It's a smooth paste, so what you would get if you removed all the texture out of a texture paste. Essentially an acrylic binder. It even smells exactly like texture pastes do. Adding sand of different grain sizes, maybe some fine sawdust, some paint if you want, and you get about 500 mils of texture paste. Because you add about as much texture stuff, sand and that, as you need binder, for less than the cost of buying one tub in the game store. And this is the kind of thing worth experimenting with when working on large projects, using non-hobby store items, making your own mixes of things. Can you use an indoor wall primer to prime your board? Can you make your own texture paste? Can you use bark or such from your garden? It's all worth taking into account. I, however, did not use this as a texture paste specifically. I used it more as a spackle. 
I added sand, very fine grain sand, to the acrylic modeling paste and covered every single gap and XPS join I could find. There's gaps around every single plastic 3D printed thing in the XPS, every rock, every piece of cork bark, the joins between the XPS sheets and so on. And we can't have that, says the perfectionist devil on my shoulder. The other shoulder is uninhabited, by the way. Using this sort of texture paste means I can sculpt the joins into shapes that, again, are different from the carved XPS, like dunes of sand or muddy trenches. And because of the texture, it's something that doesn't need to be covered up in the future if I don't want to. Adding to that, the acrylic is strong and durable, but with an ounce of flexibility, which means I don't have to think about things cracking. Something that could happen with a wall filler, for example, because of the slight flexing that occurs when moving or transporting this piece of scenery. Speeded up to several thousand times the speed of life, it looks fast, but this was more than a full day's work. And I even got some help to do it. Everything that is sort of pink looking on the board is homemade texture paste that I've hand scooped on with a little brush and modeled into place. Because this paste mix turned out so cheap, I started using it creatively and excessively. My trenches have wooden planks in the design of the 3D print itself, but I've deepened the trenches into the XPS to fit larger units of soldiers. But it kind of looks weird that there's no planking going on in the XPS foam parts. So I made a bucket load of hand-carved planks from ice cream sticks, flooded the trench with texture paste and placed my little planks. Blending whatever detailed plastic, be it 3D prints or purchased hard plastic bits into the terrain like this is very effective in terms of realism, instead of having obviously glued in bits on top of a scratch-built terrain. Covering parts of them with terrain, in this case texture paste, and continuing the idea of planks sells the idea of an entire trench and not just a carved hole in the terrain with 3D printed trench bits in it. Building on this idea, I stuck to the plank vibe when attaching some of these extra sandbag bits to the trenches. There were obvious gaps, and instead of filling it with foam or paste, I built small supports from wooden planking. These are minute details, smaller than the scratch-built jetty. But because of the jetty and the wooden bridges and the planks in the trenches, adding a few similar wood details to the trench means I'm tying the board together visually and thematically. Just doing this planking in one place and one set of sandbags would look a bit weird, if even noticeable. Having similar wooden structures all over the board makes it all come together as one world instead of a collection of bits. This obviously does not have to be wood sticks. It could be sheets of corrugated metal, in scale, mind you, or for futuristic tables, something more modern looking. But reusing a material throughout a board will most probably help blend together your different bits and help tell a bit of a story. This, as an example, is what a hexagon mesh looks like, something that would work real well in a more futuristic setting. Instead of using the nice unsullied sheet I had, I found some leftovers from prior diorama bills. Smearing out a load of sand glue, I then placed the mesh in the paste and pressed them down gently. Brushing around with a wet brush, making it look like a muddy and downtrodden little security checkpoint. Make sure you have your passports ready. Please place your tanks in the tray and don't forget to remove the batteries. Empty your pockets of loose bayonets and any nitroglycerin must be placed in a Ziploc bag. I then realized I'd totally forgotten I was to have the remains of a forest on top of the hill. Symbolically speaking, I find that terrain is a lot about symbolics. A couple of dead trees make a forest. A couple of tombstones make a graveyard, and so on. The trees themselves are 3D prints and I glued them in where suitable. The interesting thing here is another bark. This is most probably pine bark, but I bought it from a gardening center in a bag labeled orchid soil. Another cheap option for us city folk that don't have pine trees growing in the backyard. I've sterilized these in the oven. You can Google how to do that. A good thing to do if you pick things from outdoors, unless you want bugs and stuff coming alive in your diorama. This bark I've used a lot on miniature bases as pieces of rock, and I used it here to make the fallen tree fit nicely to the XPS. I spread out more bits around it, creating a little different style environment up here on the hill. 
While having taken the hike up the hill, it was time to build the bridge. Thematically, this is a ruined railway track that has collapsed and half-heartedly transformed into a scrap bridge. Practically in-game, it creates a passageway over the hill from one side of the board to the other. Good for troop movement in a large army-style game, but also a fun elevation feature for smaller skirmish games played on this section of the board. Again, I used 3D printed bits and again ice cream stick planking. My major concern here was building something very stable. Some of the bits are resin prints and they're prone to breaking. So my construction is very much about gluing as much wood on there to reinforce the more fragile parts. A large portion of how long a gaming table takes to build is not only about the level of detail, but about the original plan. This, for example, could have been a hill without a bridge or a stream. Natural passageways could be carved into the foam, saving time on scratch building a bridge. Something to take into account at the planning stage. I kind of didn't. My mind eloped more than usual and said yes to every silly idea it could conceive. This leads down dark paths littered with the bones of time managers. Obviously, my diorama level enthusiasm doesn't help. But let's face it, the bridge and the jetty are not necessary. They're just fun. We're now on the home stretch. One last thought on money. I find I have hobby stuff lying around that I either will never use or that is slowly going bad. For example, texture pastes. These have a tendency to slowly dry out on me before I have the chance to finish them. I bought these over a year ago, used on lots of bases, but there's still about half a tub's worth in there, but it's slowly curing faster than I can use it. So I decided to use them on and in my trenches before they go totally unusable. I'm applying a thin layer of texture on these 3D prints to blend them in with the scenery. They have 3D sculpted dirt and earth on them, but I never think that looks very real. And the 3D sculpted dirt just doesn't blend in well with the rest of the dirt on the board. I also placed some loose sandbags in the dirt on the trench system to make them look less regular. Some dirt paste and some irregular sandbags very much makes the trench look like a man-made thing. I also smeared some paste in the trenches, muddying everything down properly, as well as dirtying down all the things I built out of ice cream sticks. Finally, I made muddy tracks on my stretch of road that crosses the board. The passing beyond use by date paste is one example of using stuff you have around that maybe needs to be used or never will be used. Paint is another example. Have you invested in a new paint brand of paints you like better than the other ones you used to use? Maybe paint the board with the old stuff that's dumped in a box in the cupboard. When I get to the painting stage, I'll definitely consider this, and I might also do a bit of painting with oil paints. I use oil paint for miniature painting sometimes, and the tubes of oil paint contain so much paint, I'll never get through it in a lifetime of miniature painting. So why not use some on the board as well? I know we like to collect things, but in the end, their purpose is to get used. How much a board costs and how long it takes to build is up to you. You can spend a lot on material, but build it and paint it fast. Or dumpster dive for material, but build it under the course of a year. Whatever works for you. The wood I built the frame for this board out of, seen in the first video, cost about $120. I mentioned some other sums throughout this video. I'm now probably up to $250 or $300 in total. Not counting the cost of tools and STL files and 3D printers. Time-wise, well, to put it mildly, a lot. Everything you've seen me do in this video is just one half of the board. Now I need to do all of the same on the other half, then move on to more textures like rubble, rocks, sand and debris, and then paint it all. Wish me luck. If you want to support me, my board and videos like these, please check out the 52 Miniatures Patreon. You can also leave a super comment here on YouTube. For those of you watching this video as it's released, happy holidays. I'm glad to have been able to put out 32 videos this past year. I very much enjoy making these videos and I hope you've been enjoying them too. Thanks for watching. Bye.